there, it's Christy. Welcome back to my series on the historical Jesus. As I said in my previous video, there's a segment of the atheist community that is firmly committed to the idea that the Jesus of the Christian writings was a myth. What the word myth means is itself dependent upon whom you ask, but what connects the various and contradictory accounts of mythicists is that the texts are not based on an historical person whose life can be connected to the stories told about him. In this video, I'm going to explain why I think this view has more in common with climate change deniers than with professional historians teaching at universities around the world. Last time I focused almost exclusively on the theory of the historical Jesus and demonstrated its usefulness when applied to elements of the Christian writings. As we saw, we can use it to account for the existence of Aramaic words in an otherwise Greek text, and we saw that a passage from Mark made more sense in Aramaic than it did in Greek, whereas another passage we examined from John only made sense in the Greek, and no sense when translated back into the language spoken in the Galilee in the first century. By applying the theory to the data, we were able to then categorize data into two different categories stories that could plausibly be traced back to an historical Jesus, and ones that definitely couldn't. In that video, I mentioned that I didn't find the mythical Jesus theory convincing, but I didn't go into why that is. Before I make more videos demonstrating that the texts can best be understood using the theory of an historical Jesus, I want to review mythicist theories over time and what I see as their flaws. Now, again, this whole video series draws from various books by Professor Bart Ehrman, and again, this particular video draws on his book, Did Jesus Exist? In his book, Ehrman writes, A number of mythicist authors publish books that are not even close to resembling scholarship in support of their mythicist view, and instead they present the unsuspecting reading public with sensationalist claims that are so extravagant, so wrong-headed, and so poorly substantiated that it's really no wonder that scholars don't take them seriously. But if scholars did take note of them at all, it's simply to point out with amazement that such inaccurate and poorly researched publications could ever see the light of day. It is fair to say that mythicists as a group and as individuals are not taken seriously by the vast majority of scholars in the field of New Testament, early Christian, ancient history, and theology. Established scholars continue to be dismissive, and mythicists are, as a rule, vocal in their objections. As I will indicate more fully later, I think Wells and Price and several other mythicists do deserve to be taken seriously, even if their claims are, in the end, dismissed. What is, according to Ehrman, a summary of the mythicist views? He writes, the case that most mythicists have made against the historical existence of Jesus involves both negative and positive arguments. On the negative side, mythicists typically stress that there are no reliable references to the existence of Jesus in any non-Christian sources of the first century. This means that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are our only real sources for knowledge about the historical Jesus and mythicists find these four sources highly problematic as historical documents. Moreover, mythicists typically point out that the Gospels cannot be trusted in what they do say. Furthermore, many mythicists insist that the four Gospels ultimately go back to just one of the Gospels, Mark, on which the other three were based. How plausible is that if Jesus actually lived? Given all these problems, some mythicists insist that the burden of proof rests on anyone who wants to claim that Jesus did, in fact, exist. Added to these negative arguments is one very important positive one, that the stories about Jesus, many of them incredible, all of them based on late and unreliable witnesses, are paralleled time and again in the myths about pagan gods and other divine men discussed in the ancient world. For now, it is enough to stress that mythicists make a two-pronged argument. Given the negative argument that we have no reliable witness that even mentions a historical Jesus, and the positive one that his story appears to have been modeled on the accounts told of other divinities, it is simplest to believe that he never existed, but was invented as another supernatural being. In this reading of the evidence, Christianity is founded on a myth. These negative arguments are why I see mythicists as having more in common with climate change deniers or creationists. 
Their main aim is to attack the evidence we observe in order to discredit it, and their theories don't produce knowledge. The same logic goes that if you can just discredit the climate science, or the evolutionary findings, or the evidence for an historical Jesus, then you must accept their idea of climate not changing, or creationism, or a mythical Jesus. Do mythicists actually hold themselves to the same rigorous standards for theory generation that other scholars do? Has the world learned a single useful thing from applying mythicist theories to the observable evidence? Scientific theories build knowledge by triangulating with other areas, and there is a progression in our understanding of phenomenon. I mentioned Darwin in the last video, and we can see that the theory of evolution not only contributed original knowledge, it lined up with other fields of research. Darwin didn't have a mechanism to account for the variation in offspring because he was unaware of Mendel's work on discovering genes. But the two fields complement each other because they are explaining the same phenomenon. The same with paleontology. Darwin's system could account for the variation observed in ancient and now extinct species. The historical Jesus theory has made contributions to our understanding of the stories in the Christian writings. We saw in the last video the device of translating things from Greek back into Aramaic, and because of that we are able to specifically exclude some Bible passages as being later inventions added to the Jesus story, and others that could plausibly be tied back to an historical person. That's, that's actually a huge thing. The fact that the historical Jesus theory itself allows us to put different stories from the Gospels into different categories, ones that could plausibly be linked to an historical person, and ones that can't. This is important for scholarship because it allows historians a mechanism to narrow down the evidence of what they're looking for when they want to, say, understand the theology preached by the historical Jesus. And this is how theories produce knowledge. We don't find this in the mythical Jesus tradition. As we'll see, the mythical school of thought doesn't build on itself. It doesn't refine itself. It doesn't triangulate with other scholarship. Instead, what we have is a lot of pseudoscience, where people cherry-pick texts and provide a weak and unsubstantiated interpretation of a few of the facts that support their own personal preferences, while leaving a lot of other evidence unexplained or ignored. An example of this pseudoscience at work is just look around for comments from people who assert that the Christian religion was invented by some Jews who lived in areas where there were a lot of Greek-speaking people. Ask them what they mean by the Christian religion. What exactly was the first theology taught under this mythical Jesus religion? It had to have some perspective on the nature of Jesus relative to God. Was Jesus co-eternal with God? Was he adopted by God? I would like to know, but nobody seems to be able to say specifically what the original theology of the mythical Jesus community was. Who were these some Jews? What were their names? Where did they live? When did they live? Where is there any evidence that the people you think came up with this religion actually came up with this religion? The thing about mythicists is that initially their assertions sound good, but when you start to ask deeper questions, I've always found that their answers fall apart on specific issues of theology over time, and especially in terms of what knowledge they've been able to produce with their theories. Another big problem I have with mythicism is that from literally the first century of the Common Era until 1791, it didn't occur to anyone, anywhere, that Jesus might not have been an historical figure. Even ancient Jewish writers, who had the most to gain from discrediting the Jesus movement that they were competing with, that was initially part of Judaism and then broke away, they never questioned his actual existence. Now let that fact just rest with you for a little while, because I think it's important. No one denied the historical Jesus existed. Not even early Christian critics hurled the charge, well, Jesus was just made up, he never existed, so all this stuff is just pretend, which would have been a pretty convincing counter-argument to make at the time. But they don't. Not the pagans, not the Jews, not even later Muslims would doubt that a man named Jesus lived and died in the first century of the Common Era. Now another difference is that unlike the historical Jesus theory I presented in the last video, there is not one account that all mythicists agree upon. 
and this begs the question, mythical Jesus theory proponents, why are there so many theories, and why do they all contradict each other? Originally, I had a section in here where I was going to go through the history of mythicism, but it got really long. So go read Bart Ehrman's book for all the details. Here's my skip to the end, bullet points version. The first person in history to publish the idea that Jesus was a myth was Constantin François Volney in Ruins of Empire. Clearly he was French. He argued all the religions are at heart the same and that all religions are merely a variation on sun god worship. He thought the early Christians invented a savior named Jesus and that Christ came from the name of the god Krishna. Already the tradition is off to a bad start because Volney made things up rather than researching them. Christ is the Greek word for Messiah. It has nothing to do with Krishna. This kind of sets the stage, frankly, for a lot of the garbage that has been published under the title of a mythical Jesus. Using Ehrman's book, I'm just going to review the more credible versions of mythicism quite quickly because, as I said, there's a lot of terrible, historically inaccurate, and laughably unresearched mythical books out there. Just absolute garbage. For examples of this, you can see The Christ Conspiracy, The Greatest Story Ever Told by S. Acharya, and D.M. Murdoch. Another example of a terrible mythicist book is The Jesus Mysteries Was the Original Jesus a Pagan God by Timothy Frecke and Peter Gandy. So what are the ones that are not laughably terrible? Well, from the 18th century until the 21st, men have invented different accounts of how they think Jesus was invented. One version is that Christianity was an amalgamation of ancient mythologies and that Jesus was a mythical character. This is the view of Volney and Dupuis. Another version says that Jesus existed, but the New Testament's miracle stories are mythical supernatural retellings of mundane events. That's the view of Strauss. Bauer thought that Christianity was a synthesis of Stoicism and Philo, and that Jesus was a literary invention of the Gospel authors. Graves thinks that Jesus did not exist, and was based on a crucified or ascended demigod from different countries. The historical Jesus existed, but the Christ of Christianity was mythological, according to Remsburg. Drews thought that Christianity was a Jewish Gnostic cult that appropriated aspects of Greek philosophy, whereas Allegro thought Christianity began as a shamanistic cult. According to Wells, Paul's mythical Jesus and a minimally historical Jesus were fused together, while Doherty proposed that no historical Jesus worthy of the name existed, and Christianity began with a belief in a spiritual, mythical figure, that the Gospels are essentially allegory and fiction, and that no single identifiable person lay at the root of the Galilean preaching tradition. Harper thinks that the Gospels are reworked ancient pagan myths. Thompson thinks that Christianity was invented by Christians who wanted to create a savior figure out of the stories found in the Jewish scriptures. And Carrier thinks that early Christians considered Jesus a celestial being, known only by revelation. And this is why I can't do a head-to-head -head comparison of the historical Jesus theory and the mythical Jesus theory. There is no singular mythical Jesus theory. What there are, are a series of contradictory assertions. More importantly, unlike with scientific thinking, we don't see intellectual progress being made in this area. There is no progression of ideas. Each author simply comes up with their own, usually his, own version of events, and they're in contradiction to all the other accounts. To end this video, I'm going to summarize my problems with the theories of a mythical Jesus. The idea itself came out of nowhere by a non-specialist who did minimal research and wrote with an agenda to find an outcome that supported his predetermined idea that there was a universal being and that all religions were just different forms of worship for that one god. It was a bad idea and it was historically inaccurate. Another problem I have is that each time mythicists come up with a justification for why Jesus was a myth, they've been proven wrong by the evidence. The idea that they were all worshipping a single divinity and a singular religion was wrong. The idea that Jesus was a form of sun god worship was wrong. The idea that Jesus was a symbol of the dying rising god cult was wrong. The idea that it began as a shamanistic cult is wrong. Consider it this way, the mythical Jesus school of thought has been around since mm, the 18th century. And in almost 300 years, 
It has not produced a single peer-reviewed publication that increases our understanding of Christianity in the early first century. That is theory failure on an epic level. Another problem I have with it is a tendency for mythicists to destroy knowledge rather than create it. Mythicists don't really offer any evidence for other people to examine. What they tend to do is attack the credibility of all the evidence we have available on Jesus. Rather than providing theories and evidence that expands and deepens our knowledge, I've seen mythicists attack the credibility of anything related to the early Jesus movement and then declare because there's no evidence Jesus must have been made up. This is why I see a lot of parallels between the pseudoscience of creationism and the mythical Jesus positions. Both depend on destroying the credibility of scholars and undermining the observable evidence in order to advance an ideology over the facts. Finally, I just don't have any confidence in an alternative theory when people in that field all disagree with each other as to what the facts and evidence or even the basics of what their own theory is. Sure, you can quote Carrier all you want, but Wells disagrees with Carrier on whether or not Paul knew a historical figure. So if your so-called experts disagree on pretty much everything except their agenda to undermine the evidence for an historical man named Jesus, well, then I can't really take anything that they assert seriously. My problem with mythicists is the amount of false information published by authors in defense of a mythical Jesus, the lack of serious scholarship by authors of these books, the focus on attacking ancient texts instead of trying to understand them, and the lack of any meaningful contribution to historical scholarship in nearly 300 years. Okay, now that we've wrapped that up, we're going to move back into the historical Jesus theory and applying it to the evidence. And in the next video, I want to take a very broad look at evidence over time. In the first video, we looked very narrowly. We looked narrowly at specific texts that had Aramaic phrases in them in an otherwise Greek text that was designed for an international audience. In the next video, I want to look at the progressive theology that emerged about Jesus over the first 200 years of the early Christian church, and look at the progressive nature of the theological evolution of Jesus over time, and how this maps on quite neatly to the idea of an historical Jesus. I've been Christy, you've been awesome, thanks for your time and attention guys, and I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.